This, con this conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon and welcome to today's ACRM Pandemic Web Webinar Series. This series of webinars is being produced by ACRM and the ACRM Technology Networking Group in an effort to bring much needed information to rehabilitation researchers and providers regarding the use of telehealth during the pandemic. My name is Denise Fife, and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. I'm a senior research scientist at the Kessler Foundation and chair-elect of the ACRM, I, ACRM SCI ISIG. Today's webinar is also produced in collaboration with the ACRM SCI ISIG. The title of today's webinar is Telehealth Medicine and Exercise for Persons with Spinal Cord Injury and will be presented by Dr. Ashraf Gordy. Before we start the presentation, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping. First, attendees, please be advised that the meeting is being recorded, and we ask that you please keep your phones and mics muted and keep your cameras turned off during the presentation. We do expect to have about 20 minutes available for discussion at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions, please type them into the chat feature and we'll address as many of them as we can during the latter part of the hour. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Ashraf Gorgi. He's currently Chief of Research and Director of SCI Exercise and Body Composition Lab at McGuire VA Medical Center. He is also a Research Clinical Specialist and Director of the SCI MOVE Program at the uh, Spinal Cord Injury and Disorder Service located at McGuire Medical Center. Dr. Gorgi has received research funding through the VA Rehabilitation R&D Career Development Merit Award, National Science Foundation, and DOD CDMRP to study the effects of exercise training after spinal cord injury. He is a member of the research team in charge of running the exercise physiology and body composition and locomotor laboratories. Dr. Gorgi is a professor in the Department of PM&R at Virginia Commonwealth University. He also serves as faculty in the PM&R resident program. He is also an American Physical Therapy Association clinical instructor since 2009, fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine since 2010, and fellow of ACRM since 2018. Dr. Gorgi, we welcome you and look forward to your talk. And I'll now turn over the presentation to you. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Denise. Uh, and thanks to ACRM and thanks to uh, the Pandemic Webinar Series uh, for giving me this uh, honorable and great opportunity to, to be among you today. And hopefully uh, my presentation at the end of this event uh, will shed uh, the light on how <laughs> to deliver an effective exercise program uh, to uh, persons uh, with a spinal cord injury uh, using our telehealth uh, communication uh, technology as well as our uh, virtual care program. Um, and my goal and my mission um, as a research scientist at the VA uh, is to be able eventually one day to transfer this uh, excellent technology uh, to the spinal cord injury model system uh, to provide opportunities for others uh, who do not have access, especially those who live in rural areas or uh, live in third world country, uh, to be able to uh, have access to uh, exercise program, effective exercise program, uh, considering all uh, the barriers uh, that we have encountered through uh, over our careers in how to deliver uh, a consistent and sustainable uh, exercise program. Um, have, uh, have I mentioned this? Okay, I, mean, I have a hard time advancing my presentation here. Oh, so, so um, just uh, um, a few, uh, just uh, referring to our uh, ACRM conference, um, uh, this year in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, this year we will have the conference uh, both delivered in in-person meeting or uh, virtual. And since we are uh, presenting about uh, virtual care or uh, telehealth medicine, I just sought to highlight this 
in my presentation. Also, I would like um, uh, to say thank you one more time to the uh, SR Pandemic Webinar Series, uh, John and his team for uh, this great invitation and for presenting uh, the SRM uh, um, uh, community uh, in this presentation and uh, eventually um, I'm looking for more collaboration with them in the future. Um, um, this is just a disclosure statement. Um, I'm currently the chair of the FES uh, task force, FES and technology task force um, that's uh, hosted in a platform by uh, ACRM, American Congress of Rehab Medicine. Uh, also, my current research is being funded uh, by Department of Defense and uh, VA program, either merit or aspire programs. Um, and uh, this is my email address. If you feel like you have any things uh, are unclear at the end of the presentation, I would be more than happy. Uh, I know that some details may be missed during this presentation, uh, but uh, I would be more than happy to uh, eventually answer any uh, future question uh, through my email communication uh, or um, you can just like uh, uh, send me uh, correspondence and uh, I'll try to get to it as soon as possible. Uh, so today our presentation, uh, I'm going to uh, focus primarily on uh, four learning objectives and hopefully by the end of my presentation um, and although some of these objectives may require additional work and additional development, uh, but hopefully at the end of this presentation or at the end of this talk, uh, you, I will be able to address these four uh, objectives. And my first objective is uh, how can we as a community, as a rehab community, to effectively set a telehealth program uh, that will be able, that will deliver an effective exercise uh, program to our veterans, specifically those who have a spinal cord injury. Um, and on top of this, what are the guidelines that we need to uh, consider when we set this program in order to ensure it is uh, successful, uh, safe, uh, feasible, accessible, all of those things that we have to determine uh, when we are trying to establish this program. Um, and then um, uh, have we set this program, uh, can we evaluate its safety, compliance, and adherence? Is it any different from uh, being uh, set uh, under lab supervision or under clinical setting supervision. Uh, this is what we're going to see in the presentation. Um, and eventually, another uh, very important objective is just to be able uh, to, uh, by setting this program, to be able to overcome some of the long-standing barriers. Uh, many of our uh, population have we worked with them for almost 15 years now, uh, complain significantly from barriers related to transportation, availability of caregiver, um, uh, accessibility, uh, financial barriers, uh, frequency of the training. So all of these barriers, we would like to make sure that uh, when we set this program, it will be um, effectively uh, overcome or at least uh, reduced to the point that engage in uh, interact our uh, participants with a spinal cord injury into a home-based uh, program. Now also um, uh, considering um, a very important ob objective that uh, eventually our presentation will be geared on uh, on today is that consider that the, 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 the pandemic that we all uh, survive in at the moment, unheard precedent pandemic of the coronavirus COVID-19 and uh, how this is, uh, pandemic impacted all of us, not in not a specific group or a specific country, it is a global pandemic. Um, how can we ensure uh, that our population, uh, despite of this pandemic, are still have access uh, to uh, an exercise program uh, through a virtual communication? And how can we interactively uh, modify and change this program as we move on uh, with our um, uh, participant was a spinal cord injury. Um, so, uh, have I talked about this? I would like, uh, just for the sake, for those who uh, do not clearly know much about our research, um, our research have evolved and progressed over uh, the years, uh, starting working in the field uh, of a spinal cord injury, uh, specifically after I graduated from University of Georgia uh, in 2005 by 
uh, and by joining uh, the medical uh, center at University of, uh, of Michigan, uh, who will be uh, primarily at this point trying to understand uh, cardiometabolic consequences uh, um, in persons with a spinal cord injury. So, so our focus initially was to understand um, how the changes in body composition um, and you can just underline number of factors or number of outlines in this uh, term body composition, visceral fat, muscle cross section area, uh, percent fat, regional fat mass, how these changes are likely to contribute to uh, cardiometabolic disorders. And uh, one of the uh, general things that our lab uh, has entirely focused on, on sarcopenic uh, obesity and the link between uh, muscle mass and basal metabolic rate and how muscle mass when uh, gets um, experienced severe atrophy uh, as a result of a spinal cord injury, how this is impact basal metabolic rate. And we spent an uh, enormous amount of time studying basal metabolic rate and how likely this uh, through a number of factors, including exercise, wellness, uh, dietary components intervention are likely uh, to influence those for the spinal cord injury. Um, uh, another thing that we have uh, geared on uh, is just like how how can we reverse this process uh, by introducing different exercise intervention, uh, neuromuscular electrical stimulation or functional electrostimulation. And most recently, in the last four or five years, we have been focusing on uh, combining neuromuscular electric stimulation and exoskeleton training. Uh, but, uh, but now we are, in the last two, three years, now we start to uh, move ahead and start to implement technology of exoskeleton uh, training with epidural stimulation uh, in veterans with spinal cord injury. And we were very fortunate that our clinical trial was funded from the Department of Defense and we are going to be implanting 20 uh, veterans uh, in the next four or five years uh, with the idea that uh, can improve uh, health and wellness uh, in veterans uh, with a spinal cord injury. So this is just uh, briefly uh, to give you an idea of my background and what was I've been doing over the last 15 years in the field of a spinal cord injury uh, specifically. Um, so uh, I'm, 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 I'm actually going to start with this slide and, uh, and many of you may, uh, may question why I'm presenting this slide, but just to tell you that uh, why, why do we need to exercise persons with spinal cord injury? Why? Um, because if you don't try, if you don't understand why exercising, why we need to keep them active, then uh, you will be wondering what is, uh, what is the basic. And we have developed a number of research um, uh, articles and uh, peer review uh, publication to address the same question because this is a very important question and unless you have the, a clear answer on this to start with everything will become vague uh, to continue so um, when we look at the population with a spinal cord injury and compared to the general population you can see that adults with a spinal cord injury two out of three uh, persons with a spinal cord injury are at risk of developing obesity and in this case, uh, it is not only by body mass index, which is uh, typically is not acceptable uh, measure uh, in spinal cord injury, but uh, by other uh, uh, more highly sophisticated imaging techniques similar to uh, DEXA, a dual energy X-ray absorptometry or magnetic resonance imaging, which shows clearly that a percent fat mass may exceed 30% uh, in person with a spinal cord injury, uh, even uh, two or three years post injury. And the more people advance, like I mentioned earlier, they experience uh, sarcopenic um, adiposity, which is a continuous decline in uh, muscle mass and lean mass, uh, followed by increase in fat mass, and that's why they put them at high risk of obesity. On top of this, uh, men with a spinal cord injury uh, and you know men are usually encompass four, uh, four out of uh, like in ratio four to one uh, compared to women. Uh, men with a spinal cord injury are likely to develop visceral fat, which you can see in the um, in the down screen on the right down screen bottom. You can see here this is islands of visceral fats and accumulation, and this visceral fats accumulation um, encompass or contribute to what we call a central 
uh, adiposity or central obesity and likely to secrete or dump into uh, but into your body a lot of cytokines and inflammatory biomarkers that are likely to uh, shift the metabolic profile in uh, persons with spinal cord injury and put them at high risk of developing other comorbidities, insulin resistant type type 2 diabetes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and this is here uh, just to uh, uh, conclude this, that as a result of this uh, number of complications, very similar to central obesity, high blood pressure, triglyceride, insulin resistance, uh, there are a high risk of developing what you call it metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. In, fa in fact, uh, there is a study that showed that 55% of our population are at high risk. So indeed, all of these factors are likely uh, to be altered or to be attenuated uh, by the effect of exercise. Other associated factors that uh, I want to highlight or for my presentation today, uh, just to understand uh, why exercise, why should we uh, prescri prescribe an effective exercise program is extreme muscle atrophy. So you see this is a magnetic resonance imaging of mid size for a person uh, who's a T4 spinal cord injury complete uh, compared to uh, a healthy able body control. And you can see how the devastating changes in the architecture of the thigh muscles, uh, not only muscle atrophy and muscle wasting, but this infiltration of this ectopic um, adipose tissue that's unlikely to play a very uh, serious uh, uh, component to uh, to uh, to the metabolic profile, and we call it intramuscular fat. Then uh, why is this happening? Because on top of this, uh, we have seen and we started to see in the last few years, five years in, from ours, there is what we call it mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, this mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, we have measured it and seen it, and it turns out that is not only uh, uh, contributing uh, to metabolic dysfunction, but also may contribute to the changes that we see on uh, muscle size or muscle uh, changes in spinal cord injury, as well to the body composition uh, that we observe in spinal cord injury. We will continue to do more research in this area because we see, we, we see that there is uh, a remarkable or a noticeable link between mitochondria and. Uh, on top of this, which is I need to highlight quickly so I don't uh, distract from the main purpose of the presentation, that there is a big autonomic dysfunction component specifically for those who are T6 and above. Uh, this autonomic dysfunction component are likely to impact a number of the cardiometabolic systems uh, in our uh, in persons with spinal cord injury and likely uh, to uh, accentuate uh, the complication that we see at um, a number of levels or number of systems that we are studying. Uh, so, so what is what is what is so after this? What is what is what should we do? Uh, what is the medicine that we should provide? In the message that we are delivering today to the whole HRM uh, community uh, and those who are interested in rehab, that exercise is a medicine. Uh, exercise is a medicine. Exercise is a very important medicine. If it, if we, if it, if we know how to effectively dose it and prescribe it correctly, it becomes more effective than even uh, pharmaceutical intervention. And uh, I'll show you some of our data in a little bit. Uh, so the American College of Sport Medicine uh, come, uh, uh, which is um, I'm, I'm honored to be a member of them as well as a fellow of the ACSM, um, come with this uh, uh, global uh, global uh, uh, issue that exercise is medicine in 2010 and basically they provide a number of guidelines and how to for our community even healthy community and they come up with uh, specific guidelines that healthy able body person uh, one should exercise approximately 150 minutes a week at moderate and vigorous intensity but these guidelines uh, <clears throat> was recently challenged by the um, by the SEI community, and um, uh, Martin uh, Martin Guinness uh, came up with a new guidelines that was just published a few years ago in uh, the Journal of Spinal Cord, and basically showed that for a person with spinal cord uh, injury, in order to maintain cardiovascular fitness um, and maintain muscle strength, which is a, a very important component of a spinal cord injury health, and we should uh, participate in 
uh, 20 to 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise in at least twice a week. Uh, so this is a new recommendation and this is the guidelines that we should uh, aware before we deliver any exercise protocol that um, a dose of 20 to 30 minutes, that's a minimum uh, of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise and at least two or three times a week should uh, at least mitigate any cardiovascular consequences uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation. Uh, so what is what is our relation to exercise? So in, in previous in previous 10 years or so, we have thinking about how can we mitigate some of these consequences that I highlighted early in my presentation, including muscle atrophy, including infiltration of intramuscular fat, increasing visceral adiposity and center. How can we do this? And we know that uh, initially that exercise is a challenge. So we come uh, with um, with this protocol of delivering new muscular electrical stimulation uh, training, uh, where people comes to us and we start to uh, train their muscles, specifically the knee extensor muscle, uh, by placing an electrical stimulation. Uh, all of this population uh, characteristics they are uh, complete motor complete injury, which means they are Asia A and B. And if you are interested to know this, this would be a different topic. But um, they have no volition and per se, just to make it simple, they have no volitional or motor control below the level of injury. So they are motor, uh, they are paralyzed on the motor sides. Uh, they may have some uh, sensation left. Um, and we have done a number of studies uh, that we showed that by evoking muscle hypertrophy um, in the legs using electrical stimulation and standard ankle weights. And why we use the standard ankle weights? Because ankle weight is cheap, uh, accessible, easily to be used. You can buy it from any uh, stores. And uh, so, so it is not like restricted uh, to specific equipment. So uh, we have shown uh, remarkably a number of times that we can, uh, as, in, as shown in this figure here, uh, that we can increase whole muscle cross-section area and absolute muscle cross-section area uh, in the in average about 20 centimeters square. So you bring someone who's a complete injury, has been injured for four or five uh, years or even longer than 10 years, and you put them in this 12, 16 week program. And at the end of this program, you can develop muscle hypertrophy, which is expansion of the muscle or growth of the muscles or, or increase in muscle cross-section area by this level of at least 20 centimeters squared on average, which means that there is other people who respond really well and gets more than 20 and others people gets below 20. So this is, this is clearly indicative that exercise is effective. And despite the fact that someone has been injured for years, their muscles are still responsive. And this is very important message. Um, uh, to our group. But the problem is still here that we have seen uh, because we have conducted, we have been conducting a number of clinical trials and I want you to pay attention because this is, would be the rationale for using telehealth medicine in this slide. That's once we stop the exercise, once the exercise program sees, and even in, in us as a general, uh, general population, we are not going to exercise for the rest of the life. So you can see people going through peaks and valleys where they go and join gym and then later they get lazy, bored, etc., etc., and they just like, stay home and become sedentary and start to eat more and gain weight and then becomes active back. This cycle is exactly spinal cord just goes in the cycle. So there is no way that a, spine, a person with a spinal cord injury would join exercise program for the rest of his life considering a number of barriers that we are aware of. So what happened when we stop exercise? So if you look here on this slide here, it's shown by using DEXA when people exercise and then two years later they come and you find that their percent fat mass, even their trunk, legs and arms is still to show increase uh, when compared when uh, they stop the exercise. Not only this, but on this slide here, you can see that the lean mass that you spend enough time to gain lean mass, there is a considerable loss of lean mass. In fact, the loss of lean mass outweighs the gain <clears throat> that you accomplish during this exercise program. So this is a serious problem because if you market exercise for a person with spinal cord, you want to maintain, at least I'm not saying that we should continue to gain, but at least we should maintain uh, our gains 
and then we start to think about it. And the first approach that we thought about, maybe we should, in order to keep these people interacting with this program, we should reduce the frequency. And our initial proposed working frequency uh, based on the guidelines is two days a week. But we said, how, how about if we deliver exercise program uh, once a week? In, and we tested this and yes, we were able to show maintenance. We were able to show uh, maybe some gains, but uh, but again, it was not enough um, uh, to keep this population active and engaged. So we start to thinking uh, outside and just say, okay, what other thing we should do in order uh, to think? Um, before, before, before we get to this, I want to also highlight um, that uh, on top of this, the, the other reason, the other door that comes in as we speaking and encourage our motivation about the exercise program is the current pandemic. Um, and, and, and people may think about this pandemic of the COVID-19 as it is more related to the general population. But in fact, um, our spinal cord injury population are exposed to this pandemic as equally and maybe even worse than the general population. This is a study that just recently came in, and I just want to highlight some of these findings. That's, that's our spinal cord injury, specifically those who are tetraplegic, are more susceptible. I don't want to say more, but they are susceptible as equally as general population to become um, infected with the COVID-19. Uh, which is the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, um, and they usually experience uh, uh, similar symptoms, if not, of, if not even worse, including a severe weakness, um, a cough, a senior or weakness, uh, difficulty in breathing, and pneumonia with positive radiological finding. Um, so this study uh, confirmed that our cohort we need to be protective. And in reality, the ISCOS um, uh, came up with some guidelines on how to uh, how to protect our vulnerable population uh, from becoming uh, infected with the COVID-19. A number of the things that the ISCOS highlighting, including, um, which is very similar to the general population, that the, the need to wash the hands regularly for more than 20 seconds and use uh, more than 60% alcohol-based uh, uh, alcohol-based sanitizer in order uh, to protect infection. Um, the, the risk from gaining infection increase from using really chairs, and that's why uh, you have to uh, encourage our population to push the chair six feet and then clean it uh, with soap and water, um, as well as to wear face masks. Um, the vulnerability or the exposure comes more uh, from being sitting at a low um, at a low distance um, or a low position uh, compared to the general population when they sneeze or cough or there is a droplets, air droplets comes, um, that's because of the gravity effect they may expose or put higher risk uh, on our population. So all of these things have uh, been considered lately, uh, just recently, and I wanna highlight it in my presentation, um, just to tell you that this is, despite the fact that I promote exercise early, there is now factors nowadays that really uh, we need to uh, consider. So, so, so I'm I'm going now to switch gear to um, how deliver how to deliver effective exercise program using the virtual care, and I'm here uh, to tell you more about our VA model system of delivering effective exercise program uh, using the virtual care or uh, the telehealth uh, communication. Um, and the mission uh, of this program has been developed is to transfer uh, how veterans uh, have access to high quality care. Um, and this is uh, through interacting with their provider on a daily basis. I want you to understand that virtual care is a two-way communication. It is not only one-way communication. So it is not only a provider access their patient, it has to be um, effective virtual care or effective telehealth care need to be a two-way communication between the provider and between, uh, and between uh, their uh, patients. 
Um, so this is the history of our virtual care program in Richmond, Virginia, and showing how um, how our how the program evolved over years, starting from uh, 2010 as a spinal cord injury telehealth. And um, I can tell you here in this slide here that's uh, our uh, exercise program, research exercise program. Uh, comes on board in 2015, uh, which is unfortunately not highlighted here. Uh, but this is the progress of our program uh, from 2010 until 2019. And you can see today when I'm explaining in the next few slides, what is the virtual care, um, or what is the telehealth program in Richmond as evolved to, you will see a number of services that's being delivered by, by our virtual uh, care. So this is just to show, to tell you about the SCI community before and after our program. So the veteran here is the center of attention, um, the spinal cord injury provider hub and the spinal cord injury spoke and the spoke personnel. And you can see all of this were disjointed uh, before, but thanks to the uh, virtual care program and the telehealth that brings all this together. And in Richmond, I want to mention something so you can understand better understand this line. Richmond is, is considered one of the spinal cord injury hub in the southeast, um, southeast of the United States. Um, and uh, Richmond covers 13 spokes, 13 other spokes, and this 13 other spokes communicate directly in, uh, in medical in Richmond Medical Center, we have the expertise, the spinal cord injury expertise, either by uh, physician, nursing, therapist, and uh, etc. Uh, so this expertise provide us with continuous integrative communication with the spokes in order to ensure that they are effectively getting the care, especially those who uh, live away like West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, Salem, North Carolina, all of this uh, delivered or benefit from this virtual care program. Um, so this is what's uh, provided by, and this is just like a representation to show you what I just talked about. This is the Richmond here, uh, which is the center of care, and this is all the 13 spokes that's uh, been um, highlighted uh, in my presentation. This is 13 spokes are likely to all integrate it continuously, and that's why we call it integrative uh, care with Richmond through the telehealth communication program. A very important uh, point before I deliver uh, the exercise component of my talk, that in 2019, over 900,000 veterans uh, received VA telehealth, and, uh, and now it becomes a nationwide uh, mission, a nationwide policy that um, veterans can receive their telehealth care anywhere in the United States, regardless boundaries and uh, borders, and uh, because of the telehealth technology. Um, so the telehealth technology on top of being uh, very prominent and recognized activity by the, it, it facilitated a number of other service and uh, some of these are the clinical video telehealth, uh, home video, uh, secure messaging, which is very, was very, very um, out and uh, were very well received by our veteran because it facilitated one-on-one uh, -on -one communication with their provider, immediate communication and immediate response, um, e-education. Uh, so now veterans do not have to travel to take a specific classes. They only can be delivered uh, in a very interacting, uh, very uh, effective format, like I'm going to show you in the next slide. Uh, on how to protect themselves and how um, wearable technology and now so they don't have to they have they don't have to travel commute or go to a local uh, physician they can all have access to wearable technology um, and this uh, wearable technology have sensors that can deliver information very similar to heart rate monitors uh, blood pressure uh, and glucose uh, units that measure blood sugar and uh, provide all this into uh, a digital format into the system uh, where um, uh, the provider on the other side will have access to this information on a daily basis and they can provide immediate feedback uh, to the 
not the veteran. Uh, other things like apps and administrating. Two of the most important programs that uh, I've seen and I've noticed in our uh, VA system is uh, a wheelchair program, and uh, it is indeed one of the most successful program who are surplused. And um, I just uh, want to give kudos to our surplused uh, at the VA because they are doing an outstanding job uh, prescribing wheelchair to our uh, uh, veterans and how successful they are doing this um, distant uh, from distance and. Uh, prescribing cushions and uh, doing and eventually uh, when they have access to like veteran on top of this they do what we call a pressure mapping but uh, the program was uh, um, um, successful in troubleshooting problems that may arise with really chairs uh, as far as positioning uh, as far as uh, trying to make some easy correction uh, until they have physical interaction with their provider Another program which is uh, really uh, well highlighted in our uh, VA uh, community is the Pressure Ulcer Program. And the Pressure Ulcer Program uh, provide really a very excellent resources to our veteran uh, to provide educational tips on how to prevent uh, um, uh, pressure injury um, and um, and how to reduce shear during motion. Uh, what are the main risk factors that are likely to come to contribute to skin breakdown, uh, what are the points of contact that uh, uh, the veterans need to be aware of because it may uh, be exposed to extreme pressure, especially for those with high level of injury and are likely to contribute to this pressure injury. So uh, that's what we were referring to is, as e-education uh, of using the telehealth communication. Um, so our VA uh, make it very simple for provider as well as for uh, uh, for veterans to provide a secure messaging, uh, secure software. It is called the virtual care manager software. And compared to what we started on uh, using the Cisco software, uh, which was like six or seven years ago, now the virtual care manager is much easier because all what you need uh, to schedule uh, a safe and um, consistent uh, reliable appointment with your veteran is just an email um, and basically the, the veteran will have a laptop or a tablet or even a phone and they will log in using the secure system and each one get a username and password very similar to when you log into to your email address and once you click the link that was sent to you by your provider you will be able to immediately a live streaming and have interacting one-on-one -on -one interaction with your uh, with your provider a very simple uh, a very simple way of uh, of communicating with veterans and communicating with other um, uh, discipline and you can have a number of discipline on the same appointments. You don't have to have one discipline. Um, so this is very easy, which is a good virtual care manager software. A um, number of things that uh, I need to highlight in my presentation. You may not, you may not use these terms, but this is very important. Uh, the, the CVT or the clinical video telehealth. Uh, this is uh, this is exactly use of real interactive, uh, time sensitive conference. Um, uh, and is supported by technologies and um, the aim of it of the CVT or clinical video telehealth is to assess, treat and provide uh, remotely um, and um, it has more than 50 applications in the VA system. The other term is uh, home telehealth and this is referred to HT and this is another care and case management to coordinate um, health informatic disease management and technology. And the goal of HT of home uh, telehealth is to improve clinical outcome and access care um, to our veterans. Uh, so, so now, like uh, I'll go back considering uh, this uh, introduce uh, um, the, the, the program, I'll go back and just to start to think, okay, how can we deliver an effective exercise program? And one of the complications or one of the problems or downside of delivering an exercise program in the VA setting is just once you seize or any if in any exercise, once you seize or stop, I showed you what happened. Uh, so this is one of our uh, first trials that we published in 2017, and it is more like a feasibility trial. Uh, in order to demonstrate, can we uh, can we take what we have learned in lab setting and provide our veterans with the equipment necessary 
to conduct uh, an effective home exercise program. And indeed, we were able to prove that this and using the technology of um, uh, telehealth communication in, we were able to demonstrate safely and effectively that we can uh, take veterans home, give them electrical stimulation unit for exercise in a standard ankle weights uh, and train them uh, even with having a caregiver or provider to train their leg muscles and to develop a similar level of muscle hypertrophy uh, just in eight weeks. Um, and then we took this information and, um, and here is some of the data uh, and basically because this is a feasibility study, so we train one leg and we kept the other leg um, untrained, so we call the untrained legs a control. So you can see clearly the trained leg here uh, demonstrated uh, by MRI technology significant hypertrophy uh, compared to the baseline uh, and same here significant hypertrophy compared to the baseline. So indeed we were able to demonstrate that in a home-based setting uh, using telehealth communication uh, in, in a very accessible setting to the veteran and to the patient, they were able to use with training and coaching um, the exercise equipment that we utilize in lab setting uh, in a very effective way to promote a health and wellness and consistent basis. Um, so we expand on this uh, and we develop this to a more uh, home-based intervention for 12 months. So we took this pilot work and we apply for funding and actually it was funded where we were able to demonstrate uh, and we are currently demonstrate that um, in veterans who are uh, having something called coda equina or denervation, we can send them home and we can train them. And for the sake of time, this is a video, um, but I'm not going to play the video showing that, uh, that even those with Skoda Equina, we can send them home and we can monitor them for 12 months, which is even greater. So now we went from eight weeks, which is only two months, to 12 months, which is uh, uh, 10 more months longer in duration. And this is a very effective uh, program um, in, uh, in getting the veteran to comply and to adhere uh, to this longitudinal intervention uh, for a long period of time. <clears throat> Similar things, we have done uh, studies where we have uh, sent people to a uh, home with FES cycling. Uh, the VA delivers the FES cycle to people's home. And here we just like showing here, demonstrating coaching uh, this population uh, before we send them home with their FES uh, for the same reason that we can in, enhance and improve the quality of care uh, and we don't have to have the restriction uh, and the barriers of, of commuting back and forth to the lab setting. Uh, so what benefits what benefits does this what benefit does this bring to our veteran of using virtual care and exercise? Uh, it definitely ensures it is safe, feasible. Uh, there is a significant real-time interaction between us and the veteran, uh, despite the level of injury, and we can talk about this in a little bit. Uh, participant had 100% compliance. Most of the studies, exercise trials, you can see 85%, maybe the best one is 90%, but we were able to demonstrate that the participant had 100% compliance. Uh, definitely, we showed that this is cost-reducing approach it reduced travel time, uh, it reduced caregiver time, and it reduced gas costs. So uh, it's very beneficial uh, to the government because uh, you don't have to pay for travel time and you don't have to pay for uh, gas. Um, besides, it reduces uh, vulnerability of people getting injured during transfer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, using their home settings, they are feel are familiar, they are not claustrophobic, they are not dizzy uh, from traveling long distance, all other benefit. Um, uh, the major barriers of exercise and wellness are very similar to the frequency of exercise, duration of exercise, uh, accessibility to exercise equipment. All of this has been successfully overcome by, um, by, by, by providing a secure and safe uh, way to, uh, to train the patient as well as his or her caregiver uh, to exercise at home um, and using this interactive and integrating uh, and real-time approach uh, without having uh, any uh, knock on the wood, any side effects or any complication um, up till this point. Um, 
So, um, so, so, so uh, other benefits may include in enhancing aerobic capacity and reducing pain um, in conjunction to use of uh, virtual video gaming. That's where we are heading in the next, uh, where we can take our exercise program in and put it in a very interactive for a man so people can uh, use it as if you're cycling in a race or a marathon and uh, actively enhances their performance. Uh, so in summary and conclusion to my presentation that uh, telehealth medicine uh, for the purpose of delivering exercise, a program is feasible approach and encourage engagement and compliance in person with a spinal cord injury and overcome uh, long standing barriers and can allow trials up to six to 12 months. And this is very important. Uh, our preliminary findings suggest that this approach uh, is very helpful in increasing uh, some of the most uh, um, most desirable parameters similar to muscle mass and decrease um, uh, adipose tissue infiltration, very similar to what we have observed in lab setting, but um, uh, by, by also associated by decreased travel time and other associated costs. Um, and this is very important approach. And I'm going to share with you one thing that despite of our current, the current pandemic, or most of our research programs have shut down um, um, thanks to the telehealth communication because it allow us continuing our research program and continue interacting with our veterans and our population, uh, encouraging the, the social distance uh, point and safety of our program. So this is likely if this is pandemic is going to continue, uh, I would encourage many of the rehab specialists to to consider including telehealth uh, to their protocol because this is ensure uh, a safe environment and um, a safe uh, uh, a safe safe setting for a veteran from uh, getting infected uh, and uh, also it will ensure that uninterruption of the uh, physical activity program uh, during this pandemic. Uh, there is uh, a number of folks that I would like to acknowledge, uh, Melody Anderson and uh, Dr. Castillo, who are running the telehealth uh, medicine program, uh, who runs the telehealth um, uh, medical program in our facility at the McGuire VA Hospital. Also, I would like uh, to uh, thank Linda Drosty. Uh, she provides some of the educational tips about the pressure also pressure injury program in our facility. Uh, finally, I would like to thank all of our research team and excellent research team who uh, without their help, I couldn't have uh, this important information for you today. And thank you to ACRM and thank you to all and looking forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gorgi, for a wonderful presentation this afternoon. Uh, now we're going to uh, begin our question and answering session for the last few minutes. And um, so if you do have a question, if you could please use the, um, the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen, that would be great. Um, Dr. Gorgi, I see that we do have one question. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a two-part question, it seems like. Uh, the question is, are there any additional concerns about patient safety while they're performing exercises during telehealth sessions versus in clinic sessions? Well, so I mean, the, and, this, and the second part, sorry to interrupt you, the second part of that question is so it's like, you know, are there ways to ensure patient safety during the telehealth se uh, session? Right. Uh, so, so um, and I'm just going to talk about uh, my perspective. So, definitely, um, there is uh, a considerable uh, factors or considerable safety factors that need to be um, uh, included um, in our checklist in order uh, to ensure patient safety. Um, but this risk factor is all being considered under two umbrella. Um, uh, the home environment setting, what is the home environment setting where the patient, or what is the setting where the patient is going to be conducting um, uh, his training, uh, as well as the availability of caregivers. And we focus a lot on these two factors because we want to ensure that the patient, when he conduct his 
home exercise. Uh, we are very keen to, uh, if the patients, for example, have uh, pets at home, um, what type of pets are there, uh, are reliable not to run during exercise and jump on the patient leg and stuff like that. So all of this, we provide the patient with kind of like scenarios of what things uh, the patient may need to um, encourage. Um, the caregiver is very important component. Uh, so we equally, and I may not highlight this, we equally train the caregiver as a, pay, uh, as a patient um, because the caregiver play a very um, uh, liaison uh, way between us and the patient in setting as well as uh, handling some of the equipment that the patient uh, may need to uh, have, maybe plugging in the stimulator, uh, ensure that uh, the patients are not experiencing any uh, autonomic dysreflexia, measuring blood pressure on a continuous basis. So we spent a considerable, before we send anyone home, we provide the patient with considerable, uh, um, maybe two or three times training with the patient. But the good news uh, that I want to share, although that's yes, there is a considerable risk factors that's or safety factors that we have to highlight. The good news that uh, so far we have trained up to uh, 20 or 30 veterans at their home and none of them have experienced any single side effect. By far the only thing that we would think of that uh, maybe some, some shears that may result uh, from sitting on their wheelchairs in mobility which is typically may happen even in lab setting um, and we advise the patients on uh, to sit correctly uh, um, uh, to adjust their posture um, and maybe we could consult our uh, uh, pressure ulcer uh, uh, safety program uh, to on how patients could have a better posture during exercise um, so does this cover both items or uh, we have a few more questions, Dr. Gorgi, if you if you okay. can stay on, <laughs> in, in reference to, I guess, the safety issues and potential uh, side effects. There was a question about um, pressure ulcers. So if participants uh, show early signs of a pressure ulcer um, develop, uh, developing um, like during your exercise program, how, you know, how fluid or connected is your clinical program and that, you know, you're able to get them into the program, uh, get them into the scene right. um, for clinical it, it, care. And I may have highlighted this in our, the, the, the biggest advantage working in our center is that we all working as a team. Uh, so immediately we'll put a consult to the pressure ulcer uh, program expert where they would be immediately interact with the patient uh, on the spot, maybe on even on the same day, uh, and the, they will handle this immediately on the spot. And uh, one of the things that we would ask the patient to do, uh, is sometimes through the secure software, that to take a digital picture of this and send it to us so we can share it with our expert on this so they can evaluate uh, uh, on scene. And if so, um, if so, they would have to contact the patients immediately. Okay, that's great. Um, another couple of questions too about, so, you know, after the pandemic subsides, would you recommend the use of telehealth based on your exercise programs to date? And if so, how would you recommend using these tele telehealth exercise programs in conjunction with in-person programs? Uh, um, uh, definitely, we will continue to recommend and will continue to use telehealth program because, uh, as I mentioned, as alluded to in my presentation, that this is uh, a very uh, effective way to overcome major exercise barriers. And, uh, and this population overcomes this barrier is essential uh, to ensure that people are staying active um, and healthy and to mitigate some of the comorbidities. Um, uh, associated comorbidities in this population. Um, how I'm going to do this, and that's actually is a great question, um, and I think that's um, 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 uh, a program that's uh, focused primarily on, on starting with uh, in-lab uh, supervision uh, to ensure that the patient has delivered the appropriate technique and the way of uh, exercise and send them home after a few weeks will be our approach that we can engage the patients under supervision and lab training initially and then later on we send them home for the remaining period of the exercise program for home use. That's how I would approach it after okay. this. Pandemic. 
Okay, that's great. Um, another question we have, uh, what additional support or technology have you used during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, um, like I mentioned, there is a number of uh, um, a number of things that we have highlighted in my presentation, including the use uh, of uh, e-education and using the the uh, virtual uh, virtual e-messaging. Uh, I think that this is uh, one of the biggest things that's uh, uh, providing us to access. Uh, it doesn't necessarily that we have used it in person, but apparently one of the things that we are hearing is that the patient like it the most is a secure messaging system uh, because it provides direct access to their provider and within 24, and 24 hours they get feedback or answer to their questions. Excellent. Last question that we have listed, Dr. Gorgi, uh, is, tele, is tele-rehab funded either publicly or privately uh, in the United States? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, um, like I will speak about our, uh, our, um, uh, our situation uh, because we are funded from the VA program central office uh, to conduct a number of telehealth exercise program and it sounds that the VA um, as uh, a basic uh, entity of uh, delivering care to our veterans in the United States are very uh, interesting uh, in, 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 in imposing that this is the future <clears throat> of uh, the future of delivering care to veterans and eventually this model will be adopted uh, for civilians as well. Um, although we have not have done enough studies, but uh, the preliminary evidence um, as a result of this funded trials ensure it is successful, effective, um, and uh, technology will continue to improve, especially uh, with uh, with the availability of artificial intelligence and uh, IT systems and IT uh, uh, developers, uh, we will uh, continue to ensure have successful, uh, secure uh, virtual care software and systems that ensure that our veterans are safe and uh, having the same HIP regulation uh, like any standard of care. Thank you, Dr. Gorgi. And to our attendees, I want to thank everyone who was uh, able to listen and uh, enjoy the, uh, the, web the webinar this afternoon. Please be advised that all recordings will be available in the next 24 hours. And we recommend that you share this webinar with your colleagues, as well as the series that's made available on the ACRM webpage. This concludes, as we come to the top of the hour, this concludes our webinar for today. We want to just remind you to be, be safe and stay healthy, everyone, and hope that you're able to join us for our next ACRM webinar for the pandemic, during the pandemic. Thank you.